The sacrament of abortion. There are uh, two kind of extreme views, and we're going to talk about the middle as well a little bit. One view of abortion is abortion is taking of human life. The commandment says, thou shalt not kill. That means that abortion is killing, and therefore it's always and everywhere wrong, no matter what. And furthermore, if we have the power to do so, we should legislate this. And once that, having done that, we should vigorously punish all offenders. Now, there's another view of abortion. And it goes like this. Abortion is simply the removal of tissue from a pregnant woman. That tissue claim, has no claim to any kind of rights. And if the woman wants it out, for any reason, it should come out, period. And she should be the one deciding it with no second guessing. The government should not interfere. And furthermore, there's no valid moral objection to abortion. Um, if the government is the highest authority, then if the government says not to interfere, then, then there can be no valid moral objection. In fact, abortion can be a sacred duty. Sacred? To whom? Well, <clears throat> of course most of you are familiar with the fact that the Supreme Court has ruled on this. Uh, and uh, this is an attempt to be a, a compromise, although as you will see, the compromise is kind of a little bit one-sided. Roe versus Wade, and um, if you want to look it up, it's on the internet, you can read this. You don't think I've got it right? Go ahead and look at, check it out. Uh, the central part of the decision, which was put right at the front, is held. Well, you, uh, 28 U.S.C. 1253 or authorizes no direct appeal to this court from the grant or denial of declaratory relief alone. Review is not foreclosed when the case is properly before the court on appeal from special specific denial of injunctive relief and the arguments as to both injunctive and declaratory relief are necessarily identical. What's that all about? That's legalese for somebody wants the court to stop something. And there are two ways to stop it, injunctive relief and declarative relief, and I'm not going to get into exactly what those are, but the court holds that they're slightly different and enough different to where um, uh, one can be apply and not the other, but that the arguments behind them are going to turn out to be the same or very similar. Roe has standing to sue. The Doe's and Halford do not. You know what John Doe is? Legal fiction, right? You ever wondered why it was Roe versus Wade instead of Doe versus Wade since Doe would be the right one? Well, the reason why is because there are two people and they wanted to keep them distinctive. So Roe had to move over from Doe to Roe. So it didn't look like she was related to them. Contrary to Apelli's contention, the natural termination of Roe's pregnancy did not moot her suit. Apelli is Wade, by the way. <clears throat> um, so he tried to claim that, well, hey, she's already been, uh, been pregnant, so the case doesn't really matter. I think he was afraid that he was going to lose. Litigation involving pregnancy, which is capable of repetition yet evading review, is an exception to the usual federal rule that an actual controversy must exist at review stages and not simply when the action is initiated. Otherwise, she's already either had her abortion or had her baby, whichever, and by the time the Supreme Court gets around to it, it doesn't matter for her anymore. But the, but the Supreme Court said this is going to happen again and again and again and we need to get the rule fixed, once and for all. The district court correctly refused injunctive, but erred in granting declaratory relief to Halford. So it sounds like Halford is out on, in the cold. He shouldn't really have gotten relief of any kind. 
who allege no federally protected right not to assert as a defense against the good faith state prosecutions pending against him. And there's a reference there. Um, Halford was the guy who wound up wanting to do, and I don't know whether he actually did or not, the, uh, the abortion on Roe. So they gave him a, a declaratory relief and uh, therefore um, I guess the district court would have allowed him to have uh, to perform the abortion. Um, the Doe's complaint based as it is on contingencies, any one of more of which may not occur is too speculative to present an actual case or controversy. We'll, we'll go briefly into that so that you can see what in the world are the does all about. State criminal abortion laws like those involved here that escape, uh, that accept from criminality only a life-saving procedure on the mother's behalf without regard to the stage of her pregnancy and other interests involved violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which protects against state action the right to privacy, including a woman's qualified right to terminate her pregnancy. Though the state cannot override that right, it has legitimate interests in protecting both the pregnant woman's health and the potentiality of human life, each of which interest grows and reaches a compelling point at various stages of the woman's approach to term. So as the pregnancy progresses at first it's total hands off, then it's yeah you can legislate but only on certain matters and then it's you can legislate on other matters but with certain exceptions. We'll look at those. Okay, A, for the stage prior to approximately the end of the first trimester, the abortion decision and its effectuation must be left to the medical judgment of the pregnant woman's physi attending physician. Boom. So, total hands off first trimester. For the stage subsequent to approximately the end of the first trimester, the state, in promoting its interest in the health of the mother, may, if it chooses, regulate the abortion procedure in ways that are reasonably related to maternal health. That means you can require it being done in a licensed hospital or clinic by people who have the appropriate training, et cetera, et cetera. Second trimester, that's allowed. But you can't say it can't be done as long as people jump through the appropriate hoops which are supposed to be tailored to making it safer or better or something. C, for the stage subsequent to viability, baby can come out now. The state, in promoting its interest in the potentiality of human life, so now they're actually talking about potentiality of human life. Now, some people would say the actuality of human life, but uh, certainly of um, uh, the potentiality of living a normal human life may, if it chooses, regulate and even proscribe abortion. So you can have anti-abortion laws, except where necessary in appropriate medical judgment for the preserv preservation of the life or health of the mother. Now, if it had been just the life, I don't think anybody would have objected to that. Um, but when you say the health, you mean physical health, you mean mental health. So if a woman comes to you and says, if you don't get this baby out, I'm gonna kill myself. One can argue that one is now treating the mental health of a mother and so yes, and the state cannot forbid that. The mental health of the mother is the big loophole through which you can drive a truck. The state may determine, uh, define the term physician to mean only a physician currently licensed by the state and may proscribe any abortion by a person who is not a physician as so defined. So you can say you've got to be licensed as a physician. Interestingly, there are several movements, I think, including California, where they're now saying uh, will allow properly trained nurse practitioners and physician's assistants to do it. 
Five, it is unnecessary to decide, uh, decide the injunctive relief issue since the Texas authorities will doubtless fully recognize the court's ruling. In other words, now that the decision has gone out, you don't need an injunction. That the criminal uh, abortion statutes are unconstitutional. Near as I can tell, that uh, yellow stuff there is a page marker. John and Mary Doe, this is, by the way, another section, and this is explaining to you who in the world the Doe's are. A married couple filed a companion complaint to that of Roe. They also named the district attorney, that's Wade, as a defendant, claimed like constitutional deprivations and sought declaratory and injunctive relief. The Doe's alleged that they were a childless couple, that Mrs. Doe from, was suffering from a neurochemical disorder, whatever that is. Um, I love when lawyers try to practice medicine, they don't do very well. Um, that her physician had, quote, advised her to avoid pregnancy until such time as her conditions has materially improved, end quote. That's the advice, even though, although a pregnancy at the present time would not present a serious risk to her life. Well, I wonder why they advised her not to get pregnant then. That's an interesting question. That pursuant to medical advice, she had discontinued the, worth, uh, the use of birth control pills. In other words, you're not going to use them. And that if she should become pregnant, she would want to terminate the pregnancy by an abortion performed by a competent licensed physician under safe clinical conditions. By an amendment to their complaint, the Doe's purported to sue on behalf of themselves and all couples similarly si situated. So, she, they want to continue to have intercourse and then if something happens, they can just get rid of it. Notice that, that uh, this very phrasing of the Doe's position reveals its speculative character. They've, there's a few paragraphs in there that just basically rehash what you heard. Um, and, and the court is saying that if this and if that and if that, oh, come on, guys. Roe actually had a baby inside of her. So that's why it's Roe versus Wade instead of Doe versus Wade, or Doe and Roe versus Wade. The Doe's, therefore, are not appropriate plaintiffs in this litigation. Their complaint was properly dismissed by the di district court, and we affirm that dismissal. So the Doe's are out of the picture. Now, if you keep reading, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but there are some parts of it that are kind of interesting. An AMA Committee on Criminal Abortion was appointed in May 1857. That's a ways back. It presented its report, and there's the reference, to the 12th Annual Meeting. And um, inside that report, it says a pregnancy resulting from legally established statutory or forcible rape or incest may con constitute a threat to the mental or physical health of the patient. Well, I guess so. I mean, certainly um, rape is not good for how a woman feels. I, kind of obvious. And so from their standpoint, at that point, of course, uh, if you're going to allow an exception for the health of the woman, rape and incest automatically would fall into that category. It perhaps is not generally appreciated that the restrictive criminal abortion laws in effect in a majority of states today are of relatively recent vintage. Those laws generally prescribing abortion or its attempt at any time during pregnancy, except when necessary to preserve the pregnant woman's life, are not of ancient or even common law origin. Why are they saying this? Because they're getting ready to reverse it and they're saying, hey look, these haven't been around forever. We're just doing recent re uh, reversals. Instead, they derive from statutory changes affected for the most part in the latter half of the 19th century. And of course, if you're going, well, what about Hippocrates? Well, we'll get to that. Ancient attitudes. These are not capable of precise determination. We're not there, we can't interview them with our interests. Um, we are told that 
at the time of the Persian Empire, abortifacients were known, so they did know how to make it happen, at least sometimes, and that criminal abortions were severely punished. It sounds like the Persians were on a, the side of the um, pro-life people. We are also told, however, that abortion was practiced in Greek times as well as in, Roman, in the Roman era and that it was resorted to without scruple. Um, it's interesting to see who's uh, um, making those lists, but, um, but it's probably true. The Ephesian Soranos, often described as the greatest of the ancient gynecologists, appears to have been generally opposed to Rome's prevailing free abortion practices. So there was some controversy. And the top doc didn't like it. He found it necessary to think first of the life of the mother and he resorted to abortion when upon this standard he, found, he felt the procedure advisable. So if mom's gonna die, if you don't get the baby out, then you get the baby out and if it's not ready, that's tough. Which I think most people would agree with at this point. Uh, whichever side of the, of the uh, fence you're on. Greek and Roman law afforded little protection to the unborn. If abortion was prosecuted in some places, oh, it was, I guess. It seems to have been based on a concept of the violation of the father's right to his offspring. You can't kill my kid. Ancient religions did not bar abortion. Well, ancient religion. Um... It's interesting to ask how uh, the Jews felt about that, but uh, that's kind of a blanket statement, actually, isn't it? Ah, uh, well, before we get to the Hippocratic Oath, which is our next section, I'm going to take you through the Hippocratic Oath itself and a couple of things that Wikipedia has to say about it. Wikipedia being, of course, a notorious pro-life uh, uh, website. Um, there's the Greek. Okay, that's not fair. Um, this is actually the Greek translated into German and then translated into English. I will not give or even advise a deadly poison to anyone even at his request. Uh, that may be a little more enthusiastic than I would translate it. I, but we'll get to the, the way I would translate it. Also, I will never give a woman an abortifacient. Holy and pure, I will save my life and my art. Um, the precise wording is homoios, likewise, and, or, or, well, it's actually kind of can be translated and or but, depending on the context. Uh, ude, also not. A woman, you may recognize gynecos, as in gynecology. Pesan. Pessary. Thorion. Uh, that's literally corruption. But in this context, it means abortion. Doso, I will give. Likewise, not even to a woman a pessary for abortion will I give, if you were translating it literally. So yeah, the Hippocratic Oath has that in it. Well, here's the Wikipedia translation. Neither will I administer a poison to anyone when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. And that's probably a better translation of that uh, Greek before. Similarly, I will not give to a woman a pessary to cause abortion. Notice they actually use the word pessary, but I will keep pure and holy both my life and my art. So apparently this section, if you don't do that, you're not keeping your life and your art holy and pure. Now, what the Hippocratic Oath is doing is this is the first of three sections. And the logic behind it actually is a special kind of logic. It says, I will not kill my patients, no matter if they're in the womb, no matter if they want to be killed. And then the next section will say, I will not have sexual relationships with them, 
not the slaves, nor the free people, not the men, nor the women. And then the next section says, I won't tell their secrets. So basically what this is saying is, if you come to me, you are safe. That's what it really is talking about. I won't kill you. I won't have sex with you. You tell me your secrets, I will keep them. And then there's another section in between the, uh, those three that uh, says, I will not do what I'm trained to do. It says, I won't cut for the stone. That's another whole subject. But um, um, now this is again Wikipedia. The oath is arguably the best known text of the Hippocratic corpus, although most modern scholars do not attribute it to Hippocrates himself, estimating it to have been written in the fourth or fifth century BC. Sort of like the Bible wasn't written by, it, uh, for, by itself, but you know, your mileage may vary on that one. Alternatively, well, if it wasn't written by Hippocrates, who was it written by? The classical scholar Ludwig Edelstein proposed that the oath was written by the Pythagoreans, an idea that others questioned for lack of evidence for a school of Pythagorean medicine. Interesting. And it will get even more interesting when we read the Supreme Court judgment. Edelstein attributed to the Pythagoreans and they're saying, but they didn't have any doctors. Why would they do this? Now, let's get back to the Supreme Court decision. The Hippocratic Oath, they're going to meet it head on. What then of the famous oath that has stood so long as the ethical guide of the medical profession and it bears the name of the great Greek? who has been described as the father of medicine, the wisest and greatest practitioner of his art, and the most important and most complete medical personality of antiquity, who dominated the medical schools of his time and who typified the sum of the medical knowledge of the past. The oath varies somewhat according to the peculiar, particular translation. We've already seen a couple of them and you'll notice that that some of these uh, come into the, here too. But in any translation, the content is clear. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest any such counsel. And in like manner, I will not give to a woman a pessary to produce abortion, or you prefer this translation. I will neither give a deadly drug to anyone if asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. Is it Specifically talking about pessaries, is, is it this a general term? We can argue. But the thought is there, and the thought, oh, well, here we go. Although the oath is not mentioned in any of the principal briefs in this case, why did he bring it up? Because it was the elephant sitting in the room and he wanted to address it. Orando versus Bolton. It represents the apex of the development of strict ethical concepts in medicine and its influence endures to this day. So we need to deal with it, even though the lawyers on either side didn't say anything about it. Why did not the authority of Hippocrates dissuade abortion practice in his time and that of Rome? The late Dr. Edelstein, hmm, we heard this guy, didn't we? We heard Wikipedia's evaluation of him, which it wasn't very good. Provides us with a theory. The oath was not uncontested even in Hippocrates' day. Only the Pythagorean school of philosophers frowned upon the related act of suicide. So Pythagorean says you don't kill yourself. Everybody else said, well, under the appropriate circumstances, I guess you do. Um, and so, this, well, we're going to see what he, what he does with it. Most Greek thinkers, on the other hand, commended abortion, at least prior to viability, and he quotes Plato and Aristotle. For the Pythagoreans, however, it was a matter of dogma that you didn't. For them, the embryo was animate from the moment of conception. Where have we heard that before? 
and abortion meant destruction of a living being. The abortions clause of the oath, therefore, echoes Pythagorean doctrines. It's obviously not echoing Christian doctrines because Pythagoras, uh, because the Hippocratic Oath is way before the onset of Christianity. And in no other stratum of Greek opinion were such views held or proposed in the same spirit of uncompromising austerity. So that means it, uh, Dr. Edelstein then concludes that the oath originated in a group representing only a small segment of Greek opinion and that it certainly was not accepted by all ancient physicians. He points out that medical writings down to Galen give evidence of the violation of almost every one of its injunctions, that's the oath injunctions, um, interestingly not commenting about abortion itself, but with the end of antiquity, a decided change took place. Resistance against suicide and against abortion became common. The oath became, came to be popular. The emerging teaches, teachings of Christianity were in agreement with the Pythagorean ethic. So the Christians took this over and ran with it. That might be a good thing, no? Um, but the oath became the nucleus of all medical ethics and was applauded as the embodiment of truth. Thus suggests Dr. Edelstein, it is a Pythagorean manifesto and not the expression of an absolute standard of medical conduct. So if you really need to get rid of the influence of the Hippocratic Oath, you can cite an author who really didn't have a lot of justification for his historical theories. This, it seems to us, is a satisfactory and acceptable explanation of the Hippocratic Oath's apparent rigidity. It enables us to understand in historical context a long accepted and revered statement of medical ethics and allows us to ignore it. Now, that's not the end of the controversy. Um, the Supreme Court's kind of staked close to the full liberal side, but not completely there. Yes, you can make rules. But, you know, with the um, exception for the mental health of the mother, suddenly it opens up the, uh, the uh, third trimester to abortion at any time as well. Um, the Hyde Amendment was uh, submitted by Henry Hyde, and I'll give you the, uh, as near as I can tell, the original ver uh, verbiage of it. None of the funds contained in this act shall be used to perform abortions except where the life of the mother would be endangered if the fetus were carried to term. Boom. So the uneasy compromise is being made that, well, yeah, the Supreme Court says you have to do this, but we don't have to pay for it. Now, this is interesting because this is out of, straight out of Wikipedia. And on the subject, in 2018, 37% of Americans said that the practice of abortion should be legal in most cases, while 58 said it should be legal in most cases, results consistent with prior years. A minority of U.S. adults take an absolutist position that abortion should be either illegal or legal in all cases. Um, you'll notice that uh, illegal is obviously the minority. Why are they putting this up? Because now they're going to have to report something that they didn't want to report. And so they're framing it so that, well, really most people want abortion. The Hyde Amendment itself, which sounds like it should be objected to by these people, was supported by 57% of vo voters and opposed by 36% as of 2016. Oh, the reason for the flip there is because, I guess, I mean, if you add it up, let's see, 37 plus 58 is what? That's 80, 95%? Well, no, okay. And then 15% and 25%. So it looks like 
That's, uh, that includes everything. So this 37% must include the 15%, and the 58% must include the 25%. At least I think that's how you have to read that. Um, and so 58% versus 37%, and yet when you start talking about the Hyde Amendment, it's flipped. And interestingly, Wikipedia makes absolutely no comment. It just gives the stuff. And then the, the best I can say is there must be a lot of people who say, well, yeah, you can go ahead and have abortion, but don't take my money to do it. So that must be a significant chunk of the population. Uh, the most recent one that I could get hold of is quoted in Wikipedia, and it says this bill makes permanent the prohibition of the use of federal funds, including funds for the budget of the District of Columbia for abortion or health coverage that includes abortion. The prohibitions in this bill and current prohibitions do not apply to abortion in the case of rape or incest or where physical condition endangers a woman's life unless an abortion is concerned. So now rape and incest have been factored into the life exception, which wasn't in the Hyde Amendment originally, if you remember. And it goes on to say abortions may not be provided in a federal health care facility or by a federal employee. Those of you who have been following politics may remember that the Hyde Amendment, uh, the Democratic Party has wanted to repeal that uh, because they don't like it. Looks like they're in the minority in that case. So there's been this kind of uneasy legal truce that abortion is legal with restrictions, but abortion can't be funded by federal funds with some narrow exceptions. I mean, really, how many people can be claimed to have gotten pregnant from being raped? Or not, I'm not saying there's none, but it's a very small percentage. Most abortions are abortion on demand because I wanted a boy and this is a girl. Or, or uh, it's just not time I wanted to go to uh, graduate school or something of that nature. Neither side is really happy with this. And um, of course the conservative side, you can see it gaining steam. There are more conservative judges under President Trump. There's now a a majority of people who most people think would, it, and probably is true, that if they didn't have Roe versus Wade as a precedent, they would probably overrule it. Uh, and uh, if Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg or uh, Stephen Breyer uh, uh, retire or die, there's going to be basically Armageddon. Uh, at least if uh, President Trump is still president, because the court suddenly flips. Now, one might expect that abortion advocates in this situation would kind of hunker down, not say too much, not make too many waves so that uh, things will stay more or less where they are and they can kind of hang on to what they've got. But in fact, we get the following taking abortion completely out of the penal code. Uh, the New York Senate uh, produced a bill. I cannot find on the internet the last bill. Actually, I can find little pieces of it. Um, if you go here, you can see that it's actually made it in and that uh, the ruling has changed. And this is one that allows people other than physicians to do it. Um, and it takes, it takes the death of a fetus completely off of the books as a crime. If I kick a pregnant lady in the stomach and she loses her baby, no harm, no foul. Advocating abortion for any reason at all, the way to birth, or as we will see, even after birth. And this is after Kermit Gosnell. And uh, they don't believe me, this is, listen to this. I'm sorry, I did not set this up right. Let me just get this to where it will um, go where it's supposed to.
<coughs> My apologies. Let's see. See if I can get this done. Uh, I'd forgotten I got this all. Let's see. Can, uh, see, if, see what you can do, and then we'll start at the beginning. Which classifying facilities that perform five or more first okay, trimester ready? abortions? Um, okay. This bill would remove the following statutes trap or targeted regulations of abortion providers, removing language classifying facilities that perform five or more first trimester abortions per month as hospitals. It would repeal Virginia's informed consent mandatory ultrasound and 24 hour delay. It would repeal the requirement that second trimester abortions be performed in a hospital licensed by the State Department of Health. It would repeal the requirement for two additional physicians in cases of third trimester abortions. Delegate Tran. Yes, sir. How late in a pregnancy would your bill apply if a physician was simply willing to certify that, that the uh, continuation of the pregnancy would impair the mental health of, of the woman? How, how late are we talking about? In well, so, so the way the suggestion that we've um, made in the bill is to say it's in the third uh, trimester and at the, you know, with the certification of the physician, so. So how late in the third trimester would you be able to do, to do that? You know, I, it's very unfortunate that our, the, our physicians, uh, our witnesses were not able to attend today to speak specifically. No, no I'm talking that. about your bill. How, how, yeah, how, late, I mean, how late in the third trimester could a, a physician perform an abortion if he indicated it would impair the mental health of the, of the woman? Or physical health. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm um, talking about the mental health. So, I mean, through the third trimester. The third trimester goes all the way up to 40 weeks. Okay. But to the end of the third trimester. Yep. I don't think we have a limit in the bill. So, um, where it's obvious that a woman is about to give birth, she has physical signs of, of, that she is about to give a birth, would that still be a point at which she could request an abortion if she was so certified? She's dilating. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that would be a, you know, a decision that the doctor, the physician, and the woman I would make I understand that. that. I'm point. asking if your bill allows that. My bill would allow that, yes. Whew. I certainly could have said a week from her due date, and that would have been the same answer, correct? That it's allowed in the bill, yes. Yes. And in addition to what you just represented, it, it, you, you do acknowledge that you substantially changed the standard by removing a couple of words here correct substantially and irremediable like, i'm sorry line 80 80 line 80 i'm sorry can you just tell me i'm on i'm on, i think i'm in the right part that you're looking line, at well. line 80 line 80 you are changing the mm -hmm. standard under which the yeah. judgment yes. call is made for for a an abortion at any point in the third trimester you're changing the standard i'm changing the standard that. yes okay all right what type of mental health conditions would you anticipate would be uh, utilized by physicians under these circumstances to determine that a, a child that is otherwise viable is worthy of an abortion? You know, I, I mean, again, I'm not a physician, so I can't make those calls as to when a physician would determine that uh, a woman's mental health is, would, you know, would, where they would be able to certify an abortion at that point. But the doctor, the physician wouldn't have any have to have to have any special specialized training in mental health to make that determination under your bill, right? Under this bill, no. Okay. All right. Thank you, Delegate Tran. What what are some of the conditions that um, a woman could be experiencing in a third trimester late term pregnancy uh, for which abortion and not delivery would be the optimal um, result to protect either her life or health or that of the, the child, if that's even an, an interest. But what, what would be the, what, is there any um, commonly accepted medical decision to terminate the pregnancy in the late term rather than deliver the, the child if the mother's health or um, life is actually in danger? 
Um, you know, Mr. Chairman, I am aware that there are certain medical conditions where that might be an option for um, the mother, and I would actually turn over to Galena from NARAL to, to see if she has those specific uh, medical examples. help from NARAL. Okay. Thank you. So, hi. I'm really short. That's okay. Um, I don't have a lot of specific examples because I'm not a, I'm not a physician. Um, I'm an attorney. So, um, and we unfortunately do not have the the physicians could not be here today because they are seeing patients at the moment. I know that there are certain central nervous system anomalies that cannot be determined until later stages in the pregnancy. I also know that certain anomalies like the absence of um, certain organs. Okay, and, that, or, so you're um, talking about the child. Now, let me just leave that out of the equation then. Sure. In terms of the health or life of the mother, what, what conditions are there that can't be resolved by delivering the, the child rather than uh, undergoing an abortion? Again, I am not a physician. Um, what I can point to a case that happened in Ireland. That's the first one that comes to my mind um, that I'm happy to find for you and um, send you the article about. Um, I can definitely send you that article. And if you'll give me some time, I can um, ask our physicians to provide you with a list of maladies that can lead to a woman having to have an abortion at the late stage of pregnancy. I do know that those cases exist. But you don't know what they are? Like I said, not a physician. I do not, do not have those specifics about the woman. I have some specifics about the fetus. I do not have the specifics okay. about the woman. All right. And again, I, since you yielded, you, you don't have any, I'm talking to you now, yes. Delia, you, you don't have any specifics on that, obviously. No, I don't. I'm okay. not a physician. Okay, well, we're talking about a lot of physician stuff here, and nobody appears to know the answer, and the doctors aren't here. So, uh, you know, um, it would have been helpful maybe to, to have those questions answered. Did you notice they talked about the doctors, plural? Why in the world didn't they have doctors, one of those doctors, on hand? Maybe because the doctors knew the questions that were coming and didn't want to be there. I don't know. Uh, well, um, the next day, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam, who happens to be a physician, um, also is not clear whether he is in blackface or as a Klan member, but. Uh, that's another interesting, uh, and he recently got reelected, so apparently doesn't matter to the Virginia public, or at least to over half of them. Uh, but um, he had um, uh, comments on that, and I, I unfortunately I was not able to embed those, so I'm going to have to do the old-fashioned way here. if I can expand it, and I don't know that I can. So we're just going to have to live with this part. Um, and let's see if I can get this going here. There no exception. There was a very contentious committee hearing yesterday when Fairfax County Delegate Kathy Tran made her case for lifting restrictions on third trimester abortions as well as other restrictions now in place. And she was pressed by a Republican delegate about whether her bill would permit an abortion even as a woman is essentially dilating, ready to give birth. And she answered that it would permit an abortion at that stage of labor. Do you support her measure and, and explain her answer. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I wasn't there, uh, Julie, and I, I certainly can't speak for uh, Delegate Tran, but um, I will tell you one, uh, first thing I would say, this is why decisions such as this should be made by providers, uh, physicians, uh, and uh, the uh, mothers uh, and fathers that, that are involved. Um, there are, you know, when we talk about third trimester uh, abortions, these are done uh, with the consent uh, of obviously the, the mother, with the consent uh, of the physicians, more than one physician, by the way. Um, and it's done in cases where there may be severe deformities, there may be a, a, a fetus that's non-viable. 
So in this particular example, uh, if a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, the infant would be delivered. Uh, the infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, the infant would be resuscitated if, if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. So, so I think this was really blown out of proportion. Uh, but again, we want the government not to be involved in these types of decisions. We want the decision to be made by uh, the, the mothers and their providers. And, and this is why Julie, that legislators, most of whom are men, by the way, shouldn't be telling a woman what she should and shouldn't be doing with her body. And do you think multiple physicians should have to weigh in as is currently required? She's trying to lift that requirement. Well, I think it's always good to get uh, a second opinion and for, for at least two providers to be involved in that decision because these decisions shouldn't be taken lightly. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I, w I would certainly support more than one provider. All right. Let's uh, go back to the phones now uh, for the governor. We're going to talk now with uh, Mike, who's calling in. Wow. What would happen? You deliver the baby, and then you sit around saying, well, do we want to resuscitate? No. Well, yes, let's resuscitate, and then we'll discuss what to do afterwards. <laughs> Just amazing to think about. Now, some of you are probably going, well, that was just one time. That doesn't happen all the time. Um, don't think so. Actually, you will look and you'll find out that Barack Obama, and uh, um, you can read in du dueling uh, uh, comments about what he had to say. Um, uh, I have more comments about that uh, previously. Um, I can pull out another couple of uh, videos where peop where uh, Narel or um, our Planned Parenthood people are discussing this subject and they come to this very same conclusion and you just, yeah, after the, and, and you're going, why in the world are they doing that? Wait a minute, that's not right. Um, this is weird. Let's see, where is my keynote thing? There we go. I don't know why that did that, but I hope it doesn't happen again. Um, and of course, you have to keep in mind that uh, it comes out in practice. Kermit Gosnell routinely delivered kids, some of whom were viable, and then if they were still kicking, they just snipped the spinal cord and that was the end of it. Um, and he got convicted, by the way. And uh, yeah, I have, I have a video on that, and I actually, let's see if I can... Uh, um, leave that up for a little bit in case somebody wants it, but it should be below the YouTube anyway. Um, and then there's the case of Peter Singer. Uh, Washington Post, noted abortionist uh, journal. Uh, Singer often claims that his views had been misquoted. Uh, so I am quoting directly from his books, from Practical Ethics, human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons, human babies. But animals are self-aware and therefore the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. Accordingly, this is just following paragraph after paragraph and there's, there's a little more than that even in the article, I've just taken some snippets. Accordingly from Should the Baby Live, it does not seem wise to add to the burden on limited resources by increasing the number of severely disabled children. Also in that book, Singer and his colleague Helga Kuss, so he's not alone in this, suggested that a period of 28 days after birth might be allowed before an infant is accepted as having the same right to live as others. Now, uh, there's the reference to a previous discussion we've had in this class. Question comes out, why would anyone want to kill live babies? I mean, if you want to insult someone, you call him or her a baby killer, right? I mean, it's right up there with the MF uh, word. Um, if a politician wants to show how nice he, usually it's he, 
or she is, he kisses babies, right? You shake hands and kiss babies. That's what you do because you're a nice person. I mean, the only thing that competes is puppies. And it, uh, this behavior does not make political sense. But it does kind of make quasi-religious sense. And that's why I chose the term the sacrament of abortion as my topic. To further underline the quasi-religious aspect, notice that Planned Parenthood, when faced with the cutoff of federal funds, chose to forego the funding rather than give up their abortion business. And you don't have to believe me, you can believe the New York Times, although again, that's kind of a uh, pro-life. Uh, um, <clears throat> it's not all about the money. Some things are more valuable to them than money, and abortion is one of them. Now, I, I suppose the money is a little bit of a corrupting influence, but, um, but it's not just money. My title was originally chosen to emphasize this quasi-religious aspect of the problem. What I found out, that there's actually a book of that title, thanks to Jeff. And you can look it up. There's, you know, Amazon.com will sell it to you. As near as I can tell, this is a translation of a French work, L'Enfant, Le Mour, La Mort. I don't know, I probably butchered that, but um, if I'm translating it correctly, it means the baby, love, death. Is that pretty good? Okay, <clears throat> there it is, the sacrament of abortion. Now, you see all this stuff here, I'm not going to make you read that, I'll just enlarge it for you. Issues of life and death, love and responsibility are at the core of every religion. That is why the English translation of this book was originally published with the title, The Sacrament of Abortion, as it shows that the decision to abort may also spring from a religious feeling that it is the right thing to do, both physically and spiritually. As Jeanette Paris writes, uh, abortion is about love, uh, life, and death. Since its original publication, the book has been, and that's their spelling, widely used in abortion clinics in Canada and in France, and has even been given by some doctors to each and every woman, uh, it should be each and every woman, but maybe it's translated from French and so, who had the procedure along with painkillers. It's religion. But why must post-birth abortion, uh, post abortion be defended? It makes no ethical sense. If one allows abortion at all, birth is one of the few ethical cutoffs. But it does make legal sense and strategic sense. It's, that's because it's necessary if late-term abortions are to be done at all. Uh, botched abortions are rare, but not vanishingly so. Every once in a while, the baby makes it in spite of the doctor's best efforts. If there is a botched abortion and the baby lives and maybe has cerebral palsy, at age 18 the baby can sue the abortion provider with the wrong, although some might say the right jury, costs could run into the millions, wiping out all the provider's profits. So the baby just has to die. Now one can argue that early in pregnancy the mother wants her body back, and I understand that argument. If you've had morning sickness for a while, you might feel like this isn't worth it. Um, but late in pregnancy, the quickest way to get the mother back her own body is, as Dr. Northam said, deliver the baby, especially after viability. It's faster than doing standard abortion. It really is. Uh, but here, the mother does not want her body back. That's not what she's after. She wants the baby dead. But why should abortion be so sacred? And that's the, that's the real question that we're coming to. The chief reason is that without it, the sexual revolution falls apart. See, the sexual revolution got started because a new ethical system took the place of the old. Without a new system, 
which is sometimes termed the new morality, the behavior would have simply been considered as immoral. Okay, so you want to do immoral stuff? Uh, well, you know, you can do them until the law catches up with you or until the law changes or whatever. And it would have been just an argument over morality versus immorality. But you see, now you have a new morality, and the principles of the new morality is that everything is contextual. There's even a book called Situation Ethics that makes that specific claim. There, is, there are no rules that are 100%, I guess except for that one. And everything is utilitarian. The principle of love calculates the most good for the most people. And it makes love sound like a, like a, uh, well, there's six people that have this much happiness. There are 20 people that have that much happiness. Um, there's more happiness with the six, so we'll go with the six, or something like that. Um, good is defined without regard for character or an afterlife. So it's completely divorced from religion, but is roughly synonymous with happiness. And since sex temporarily makes people happy, you have a, a, a difficult time climbing that hill and saying it shouldn't be done. But, so if it feels good, do it, and the sexual revolution took hold. But this system will only be persuasive if nobody gets hurt. And almost by definition, an unwanted baby gets hurt. Otherwise, it would have been done inside of marriage, and uh, parents would have taken care of it, right? So add to that that all birth control methods can fail. Oh, I know, some of them are like 99% effective, but that's not 100%. If you do it often enough, you'll get that 1%. And attempts to persuade people that we're just all too uptight and we, shouldn't, we should accept what used to be considered bad behavior. You know, if a woman has a kid without a husband, it doesn't really matter. You guys are just, they, that hasn't really worked well. And that means that you have to get rid of the baby, period. Abortion is the last line of defense of the sexual revolution. You take that away, you have no ethical justification. You're back to, you're behaving badly and you don't care who you hurt. If abortion goes down, the sexual revolution loses its claim to morality. That's why abortion is so sacred. But I can't finish without pointing out that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has recently revamped its guidelines on abortion. Um, uh, this, is, this isn't, um, well, it does actually come down to some, some things, but uh, um, it's very interesting. It's more of an aspirational thing than it is a prescription but the aspiration obviously comes with a prescription. Again, you can get this on the internet, and it's entitled Statement on the Biblical View of Unborn Life and Its Implications for Abortion. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, obviously. Human beings are created in the image of God, and there's a whole bunch of stuff there that you can read. Ideally, it should have been uh, pregnancy, should be the result of expression of love between a man and a woman committed to each other in marriage. Pregnancy should be wanted and each baby should be loved, valued, and nurtured even before birth. Of course, that's not true. Unfortunately, since the entrance of sin, Satan has made intentional efforts to mar the image of God by defacing all of God's gifts, including the gift of procreation. Consequently, individuals are at times faced with difficult dilemmas and decisions regarding a pregnancy. So, here are our principles. The statement affirms the sanctity of life and presents biblical principles bearing on abortion. As used in this statement, abortion is defined as any action and determination of pregnancy. Uh, mm, this is mistyped, and unfortunately I couldn't copy it off the internet like some of those other things, so there can be some mistakes in that. Any action that uh, that uh, terminates a pregnancy, is, I think is what it's supposed to say and does not include the spontaneous termination of a pregnancy, also no, known also as a miscarriage, which is the important part. They're not talking about miscarriage. They're talking about people actually taking the life or causing the life of a baby to be taken. And I'm just going to read uh, through, uh, because most of this stuff you probably already know, and if you don't, you can look it up. 
biblical principles and teachings relation, relating to abortion. Number one, God upholds the value and sacredness of human life. A um, couple of paragraphs on that, three paragraphs to be precise. Number two, God considers the unborn child as human life. So God values life, the unborn child is life, and uh, this is in the womb, my mother's womb, you knit me kind of thing. Number three, the will of God regarding human life is expressed in the Ten Commandments and explained by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. And in that paragraph there's a notable phrase, the principle to preserve life enshrined in the Sixth Commandment places abortion within its scope. That is to say abortion is, may or may not be technical murder murder, but it's certainly related to murder. God is the owner of life and human beings are his stewards. We have no business to take something from somebody else, especially from God. So the Bible teaches care for the weak and the vulnerable. And in that paragraph, there's some application. Jesus speaks of the least of his brothers and of the little ones who should not be despised or lost. You recognize the scriptural references. The very youngest, namely the unborn, should be counted among them. God's grace promotes life in a world marred by sin and death. Now, this is interesting. In rare and extreme cases, human conception may produce pregnancies with fatal prospects and or acute life-threatening birth anomalies that present individuals and couples with exceptional dilemmas. Decisions in such cases may be left to the conscience of the individuals involved in their families Okay, these decisions should be well informed and guided by the Holy Spirit and the biblical view of life outlined above, which is you keep it whenever you can. God's grace promotes and protects life. So it may sound like somebody's trying to weasel, but what, what they're doing is they're trying not to dictate. And to be fair, the church has a stance on um, uh, military service which is not always honored and the church tries to deal with people who don't honor it. Um, implications, again this is their their comment. The Seventh-day Adventist Church considers abortion out of harmony with God's plan for human life. Ooh. There's a little more to that but it says basically the same thing. While not condoning abortion, the church and its members are called to follow the example of Jesus being full of grace and truth too. And here's the biggest recommendations, there are five of them. One, create an atmosphere of true love and provide grace-filled biblical pastoral care and loving support to those facing difficult decisions regarding abortion. We don't strong arm people, we counsel them. Number two, enlist the help of well-functioning and committed families and educate them to provide care for struggling individuals, couples and families. People should not have to be going through this on their own although many will probably do it anyway. Number three, encourage church members, and this, these uh, next two are really important because if you don't do this, then uh, being an anti-abortion is not really helpful. Encourage church members to open their homes to those in need, including single parents, parentless children, and adoptive or foster care children. You can't just say, okay, you gotta keep the baby and then we're not gonna help you at that point. Number four, care deeply for and support in various ways pregnant women who decide to keep their unborn children. So somebody got pregnant out of wedlock, it's our job to be supportive and care for them. If you don't do that, then saying uh, that she can't abort really doesn't make a lot of sense. And number five, provide emotional and spiritual support to those who have aborted a child for various reasons or were forced to have an abortion and may be hurting physically, emotionally, and or spiritually. So if somebody does, does do it, we are not to treat them necessarily as outcasts. And I think those are fair. And that's, there's one last, final uh, boilerplate paragraph in which I'll omit. But I am, am very encouraged that the church has taken that stand. It's gonna take a little while before it filters through everywhere that the church is uh, nominally in control of. 
Um, but I think as an aspirational statement, it is a wonderful one. I think we're living in what is hopefully going to turn out to be a new age, certainly is starting that way. It's a new dawn, at least. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. And uh, yes, a comment here and a comment there. Go ahead. Um, okay, uh, I wonder if you could put back Go back to option six. There is no option six. Option six, you just had it on the... It's not an option if that's the case. The options are five, and they're the ones I just read. Well, option You're talking six, about paragraph six, maybe? Option six. It's not option. Well, well, number six Okay. of the document. Well, let's see if I can pull it up really quickly. Two, three, four. Four, five, six is what you're That's talking the about. One. Okay. It says there several things that they want to comment. It says pregnancy with fatal prospects. That means that if a baby, the doctor thinks the baby may not survive, we have to kill him. We have the right to kill anybody who the doctor thinks may not survive. Um, I think that you're overstating it, and you, your first overstatement started with the uh, we have to kill it, because there's nothing in there that says we have to kill anything. No, no, I'm exaggerating. Yes, so let's, it, let's keep, because it's an emotional subject, and we need to be very careful not to yeah, exaggerate. Thank you. But it means, let me correct myself, it means that if the doctor thinks that the baby may not survive, the woman has the right to decide to have the baby killed. Now, then it says life-threatening birth anomalies. That includes the handicapped. We, that's why this is called the, a loophole. Item number six, uh, by the way, Doug Bachelor suggested that we should do away with point number six of the document because, because it allows things that we should not allow. In other words, we don't kill the handicap. If, a handi if I kill a handicap, I go to jail. But if, if I kill a, handicap, a handicapped baby before birth, I'm free. Then now, there, there are a couple of things. One of them is um, we have to make a distinction between what the church recommends and what the law requires. In fact, the law right now allows you to have an abortion for whatever reason, uh, as long as you can pay for it yourself. Uh, so um, I think we, you know, uh, we need to concentrate on this is recommending what the church should recommend. Um, You know, the, um, are you going to talk about Richard Hart and his Trisomy 21? Um, well, you know, uh, actually, it, uh, Trisomy 21 does not fit into this if you're being if you're being legal about it, and and the reason why is because it's not fatal. I mean, by itself. Um, there, you know, Down syndrome people that live to be 40, 50, 60, that's a good age, okay? Um, the second thing is that it's not life-threatening in the strict sense. Down syndrome babies survive. Uh, most of them survive, in fact. In fact, that's what these people don't like, is that it's going to survive for uh, maybe till they're teenagers, maybe till they're 50, and they don't want to be dealing with this. Uh, and I can sympathize with them, although I disagree with them, because I had a brother who had the mentation of a three-year-old that just died a year or two ago. Um, and it is major disruption to the family. It is. Um, fortunately, my parents did not decide to get rid of him, but of course they didn't find out about it until he was probably about six months old when he wasn't developing the way he was supposed to. 
so much for that 28 days of Peter Singer. Um, <clears throat> so this is a problem. Um, and what the church, I think, is saying is we're not going to judge in circumstances where it's actually likely to be fatal. Okay? There's nothing in there about health. It says life. Okay? That's an important point, and we may disagree with it. We may, not, we may feel better if this paragraph is not there at all because it's easy to misinterpret. But remember, the paragraph does not say the health of the mother or the health of the child. It says the life. And if you have a baby that has anencephaline, it's going to quit breathing pretty soon. Um, that's getting into a gray area, and what they're acknowledging is that um, that those are those get really difficult decisions. Now, continue to read decisions in such cases may be left to the conscious individual involved in their families. These decisions should be well informed and guided by the Holy Spirit and the biblical view of life outlined above. What that says is that even in those cases, we lean this direction. We're just not going to try to shame you into something if you decide otherwise. And having talked to some of the people who were on the committee, I know that that was the feeling of at least some of them. So, um, and the other thing is to say is that Although you may claim that this is not perfect, it's a whole lot better than where we were. A whole lot better. The document is excellent, starting, including point one through five. Right. Point six is a mistake because it's a loophole for abortions. It, when a doctor says or thinks that the baby will die, is he infallible? And let me finish because, well, uh, because I'm, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give I you a story. I hardly ever come to this class. Let uh, me finish. Yeah. This is a subject that is very important for me. I have devoted many I'm decades to this subject. I have written two books on this subject. So let me finish what I want to say. This point, point six, is was designed by the devil to deceive the church into the belief that we can still continue killing innocent children. Uh, the, the, when a physician thinks that a baby will die, he's not infallible. He made mistakes. There are many, uh, many cases where a woman said, in spite of the, the advice of the physicians to abort, she decided to keep the baby, and the baby became a living and happy child. Now, the, the, it is true that women had the legal right, the final say, but it does not follow that because a woman wants the baby killed, that the church has to be the executioner. This is where the church mm -hmm. went wrong. What, you, what you're looking for is institutional guidance that, that says, we're not going to do those things. Um, and that's why I say this is the dawn, not the, uh, not the full flowering, because I don't think that any of this is filtered through to policies in any of our institutions yet. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how it's applied. It's going to be applied the same way, to it, a similar fashion, it was applied in 1992. Well, I will make a prediction. I'm not I, a prophet, but I will make a prediction. <laughs> I, I, the, hope, I hope you're uh, right about that. I'm going to say something more about uh, one th something that you need to keep in mind in terms of physician fallibility. Uh, it's an experience that I had personally. Uh, I was an emergency physician. I had a a couple come in and they're, uh, they were looking forward to having a baby, but the baby hadn't moved for a while, so I got an ultrasound. And the ultrasound people couldn't find movement and they couldn't find a heartbeat. So I said, oh boy, 
So I referred them to an obstetrician. I think they had one already, and I told them they go to their own obstetrician, but it's been long enough that I don't remember exactly that detail. What I do remember is this. The obstetrician saw them, apparently did an ultrasound again, couldn't find any heartbeat, thought that baby was dead. So he said, okay, we need to get this thing out because it's not gonna help any. Went to uh, take the kid out. Turned out the kid was alive and died in the process. The obstetrician was devastated. The family was devastated. The obstetrician apologized profusely to the family. Uh, as far as I know, no uh, legal ramifications were there because the family understood sometimes you miss. But the story, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I did what I could, uh, what I should have done, which is refer it to somebody who's a specialist in the area. Um, but what it says is that we're not infallible and we need to take that into account while we're trying to deal with these things. And they're tough situations. Am I going to say, well, the, the doctor performed an abortion and therefore he should be locked up? No. But I am gonna say that I think with that experience in mind, we need to be really, really careful about even doing things that look like they're uh, pretty obvious because we can be wrong on that. I mean, if the baby was dead, why not take it out, right? It's just bothering the mother for no good reason. As it turned out, we couldn't detect everything that was going on. If the baby is dead, nobody will object to taking the That's baby, right. baby out. That's right. But it's what I'm saying is abortion. it's hard for us to be absolutely sure of anything. But it's not an abortion. Taking a dead baby from the womb is not an abortion. Right. An abortion, my definition of an abortion, is the intentional killing of a living baby, not a dead baby. That is absolutely correct. And let me make a pr my prediction, and I, I did make it before in your presence. The Ted Wilson said, let's avoid the word guidelines. Let's use the word protocol. Big deal, protocol. Killing the baby, now we call it protocol. The protocol for hospitals. So let me make the, my prediction. The pr word protocol that will be implemented now by the church will become a bad word in a shorter time. It will not take five decades to become a bad word. It's going to be a bad word in a very short time. That's my prediction. Well, guidelines aren't a bad word. It's just if the guidelines are wrong, then, well, then they're the church, wrong guidelines. The church, is, the church yeah. decided that, that, that we should avoid the word the word. Uh, uh, Actually, in some guidelines. ways, uh, protocol is stronger than guidelines. But, uh, but it, uh, in any case, I think that this is, I, I think that the pro-life people have pushed, uh, it's very much like uh, what happened with our statement on creation. You may remember that at first there were kind of words that were deliberately designed to be weasel words. It sound like we were saying something when in fact we weren't or at least the people who wrote it weren't. And they were happily agreeing with, the, uh, with, uh, with uh, belief number six because they had worded it in such a way that they could say that they believed in it even though, in fact, they didn't believe in what most people thought they believed when they said that. Um, we are getting closer and we will see what happens, but technically, if you look at six carefully, it was designed by the, the people who did that to allow for some grace in, in the church member. It's not actually intended to be a guideline for the, uh, uh, for the hospitals that we run. Uh, 
It is, in de it is designed to be uh, uh, gracious to church members who feel uh, differently than what the church does, but it is, it is intended to say that even in those cases, we err on the side of life. Um, if you read it carefully, that's what it says. And like I say, it would be interesting to see how it uh, gets institutionalized. Go ahead. Uh, might it be helpful to <clears throat> um, sort of add, sort of supplement or adjunct to this, <clears throat> basically say that this issue will be reviewed in a certain period of time to see if in practice our institutions are are doing uh, are th that the that what's happening uh, in our institutions is in line with what we intended, especially by number six. Uh, it would be um, I think it would, it would be worthwhile to do that whether or not it says that. Well, I'm I'm concerned that if it's not mm -hmm. specified that we are going to review this at a certain point, be because people who want to continue. <clears throat> whatever the current practice is in terms of elective abortions at Adventist institutions, um, that this would be changing. Um, if there are individuals who want to continue that practice, then maybe they'll try to, even though I agree with you, this, it doesn't look like that this is really, that this is specifically trying to be more precise to get a, an outcome in line with one to five. Yeah. Uh, and, and so if in practice, you know, two years from now, it's, it's turning out that, you know. That people are just uh, using that as it, a way to, to get around the, the whole right, problem. Right, that in practice it's not according to the spirit of, of what the church yeah. is trying to do. Then there's a point in time in which it will be evaluated and said, hey, maybe, maybe there is a loophole here. And so now let's, let's you know, well, I be think clear on that, what. I think that one of the things that this shows is that at present, there is a majority that prefers a vigorous pro-life stance. Um, I'm going to be cautious about saying an absolutist pro-life stance because I don't know of anybody who would refuse somebody taking out an ectopic pregnancy, which is technically a live embryo, uh, but is in a position where if you wait long enough, it, both the mother and the baby are going to die and, and the baby cannot survive to, uh, at least with our present technology, um, it cannot survive to term. So uh, most people will say, yeah, in that case, we just have to, do, we have to take the, the fetus out, or the embryo, I think if by that time it'd still be an embryo, um, out because, uh, because there's no chance of, of helping and, and the mother is going to die. And I think even the Catholic Church would allow that kind of um, uh, treatment for an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and in fact, one of the things that's sometimes done is they give methotrexate and it's, uh, the, the fetus just simply can't handle it, shrivels up and dies. And I don't think most people are gonna say that's wrong because at, at present we don't have any better treatment for it. If there was some way of, you know, kind of taking it out of the tube and putting it in the ovary, I think there'd be some people who'd want to try that. And, and if it becomes a standard procedure, I think many people would want to try that. Um, but uh, at present we don't have that and so uh, I think that you'd have to say that's one of those cases where we probably are just going to have to uh, um, basically fold and, uh, and take the loss. Um, but, um, but there are some, uh, there are, you know, abortion on demand is entirely different from that kind of thing and most people recognize that. If, uh, uh, if it's and, a and question have, of saving the life of the mother, no, no one I know would object to take the baby out. If the baby gets yeah. survived because it's at the point of viability, that's great. If the baby dies, in other words, no physician should be blamed for his inability to save both the life of the baby and the mother. Yeah. So in that case, it's justified. My final word is, I, I am very sorry to learn 
that Mark Finley has blessed section six. That's a disgrace for our church. Yeah, well, uh, fortunately the church does not uh, stand or fall with Mark Finley and uh, we will have to see what happens. Um, I am hoping that people will figure out that uh, that the church's stance has changed. I'm hoping that they will realize the reasons for it and I, they will either be more vigorous in, the, in, in making their own stand or perhaps in some cases in changing their stand because I think it's very clear what this, uh, where this is heading and it is not heading in the same direction that we were heading in before. Um, and you may remember we discussed this about the church versus a small part of the church that happens to be in leadership position. Um, I can't excuse those people necessarily. Um, I can excuse the church because I think there are a lot of us who have felt for a long time that uh, abortion except to save the life of the mother uh, is not appropriate. And that includes some of our gynecologists too. It's not just people who otherwise wouldn't uh, uh, make any money off of it. Yes. I, I wonder if, uh, if uh, well, it, seems, it seems like in large part the, the whole debate about abortion has been influenced by a, by a very uh, powerful slogan, i.e. the woman should be able to do what she wants with her own body. And, and, and I think that that, that slogan greatly distorts the facts. Namely, uh, the, the, the object of whatever you want to call this inside the, the mother is, is not in any way part of her body. It's, it's, got its own, it's got its own DNA. It's got its own heartbeat. Those two things by, by alone indicate that, 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 that whatever you want to call that thing, it's not part of her body. And so there's, there's a great confusion uh, between location and identity. That thing, whatever you want to call it, has its own identity, even though it might be located within the uh, mm -hmm. the woman's body, and therefore, I think it's just, it's a game changer in terms of how things get assessed, because because, well, I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah, no, no, I agree, I agree, and there's more than that. Um, I think last time we went over the the question of well, if you can do it painlessly, isn't that okay? And the fact of the matter is that it's not okay if you can do it painlessly. If you want to kill somebody and you give them ether first so they don't feel anything and then you strangle them, um, society frowns on that. And if you give them ether and then you give them, um, let's say, adenosine and um, cause their coronary arteries to constrict and spasm, and so everybody thinks they had a heart attack and died, and so you haven't hurt the family any more than, that they, than they would have if the patient had died anyway. So what's the harm? Um, that doesn't cut it either. You know, if, they, if, if the state ever finds out, even if the family doesn't, the state will come after you, and I think for good reason. Um, so the, the, the truth of the matter is, as I said before, the major damage that is done is actually not to the fetus. Yes, the fetus is deprived of a life that it could make. The major damage that is done is to the person or persons who are doing the killing. And when you rephrase it that way, what we're doing is we're trying to protect people from themselves. And if you've been in emergency medicine as long as I have, and you've been observant um, without trying to bias things, you'll find out that those people feel terribly guilty. And they, feel, they will feel guilty in a way that um, comes out in weird ways. Um, a woman who and I'm thinking of specific cases, so I'm not going to put any more identification on, ask me 
am I having this miscarriage because I had an abortion when I had not made the suggestion at all to her? And when she had, in fact, not reported to me an abortion until when she made that comment, tells me that inside there are huge questions, huge feelings of guilt that I did not put in because I didn't even know to put them in if I had wanted to. And I try not to try to make people concentrate on their guilt. I try to, if I'm talking to them about God, I try to concentrate on his forgiveness and his love and his acceptance of us. But it obviously bothered her a great deal. Um, and she's not alone. And what these guidelines are really doing is it's, it's trying to keep us from becoming, and we know it in our heart, murderers. That's what it's really trying to do. And when you look at it that way, that gives even part six a little different view. Um, now, whether some will take it and run with it, I hope not. If they do, I do suggest that they change it in such a way to where you can't run with it. Because I, d I think that our institutions really shouldn't be in the business of ending human life for anything other than trying to save another human life that's inextricably entwined with it. I think that's the only really good excuse. But we will see what happens because, uh, and like I say, you may not like this as perfect, but it's sure a whole lot better. It's a whole lot better in tone, and it's a whole lot better in specifics than the last round. And, uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's like belief number six, where we have done with creation. They took out the weasel words and they tried to put in something that you can't get around. We have to wait until they come up with the protocols. And many, uh, I, I wish you would uh, maybe consider showing, there are two videos that, uh, uh, that deal with abortion at the General Conference Executive uh, Committee. And uh, there are several individuals, several uh, especially physicians requested that the rape be included as an yes. exception. Yes. So we need to wait and see what happens. But thank you very much for presenting yeah. this uh, topic. And I apologize for yeah. becoming And it's okay. So, so and by the way, you'll notice that rape is not mentioned in, se in section six. I'm sorry? You'll notice that rape is not mentioned in, in section six. Yeah. But so they, I, they, they didn't take that bait. Or, or in five or four or three or any place else in there, I don't think. Yeah. Um, or incest. Or incest, which are the two big things that people push. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they, uh, whether they did it perfectly or not, I don't know, but their intention is clear and it's different from the previous intention. So we will see what happens. Yes, um, maybe we can make this last comment. Uh, not to take away from anything you, you've been saying, that's all good, I like that. I just want to reiterate what I, what I mentioned before. Namely, if the, it seems like the main operative principle is a, is a person should have the right to do what they want to do with, with their own body, but that's not stated that way. It's like a woman should have the right to do what they want to do with their own body. So, 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 so why, why is there, there this, this genderized uh, bias to where only women have the right to do with their own body, but the fetus does not. I.e., why isn't the fetus allowed to express its desire for, for, for what it chooses to do, which is you just leave it alone. It'll express that by being born. Well, actually, if you go back to, let's see if we can see, um, Jesus speaks of the least of his brothers and of the little ones who should not be despised or lost. The very youngest, namely the unborn, should be counted among them. So it looks to me like they're actually trying to deal with that. 
And they're not, they're being careful because they don't have a biblical text that says thou shalt not abort thy baby. But they, but they are putting that in the context as the least of these that need, um, uh, should not be despised or lost. And I think that if you, if you read that and if you read the implications of that, I think you'll get where you want to go. Yeah, I get what you're saying in terms of the context that you're mentioning there. I'm speaking of a larger political national Oh, uh, you're absolutely right that, that the fetus is completely ignored in this thing. And, you know, in, in terms of politics, the worst part of it is <clears throat> a woman at, at seven months, if she wants her baby out, baby can survive. S deliver the baby is the easiest way to get your own body back. But that's not what they want. Right. So I, I think if, if they could expose the hypocrisy in, in the, the, that, that appeal to that particular principle, I, they're, they're being very hypocritical about it. They, they only apply the right to the, to the woman and not to the, to the yeah. fetus. I, I think that if we can establish the principle that if the baby can get along on its own, then the mother has no right to kill the baby. I think at that point, the, did you notice that Kathy Tran was really uncomfortable, had to be probed here and there before she finally admitted, yes, you can abort the baby as it's crowning? Because she knows that that's political dynamite. She put it in the bill so she doesn't care. But she does care that people find out about it. So um, people on the left end of the political spectrum um, you know, lift up and support the underdog over the overdog. <laughs> so the, the biggest underdog is an unborn baby. It's hard to imagine anything more dependent. I mean, um, children, you know, think about the children is, is a phrase used for all sorts of legislative acts by the left. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so this is not a rhetorical question. I'm, I'm saying what... What about the unborn children? Well, the, you know, this is the most... So, so is actually the underdog, overdog, is it actually the moral people versus the immoral people? And that takes precedence over the mother who has more power, power over the completely helpless. Well, like I say, it goes back to we want to do what we want to do, and then if anything happens, we want a do-over. Abortion is basically the demand for a do-over. Just erase the past, and we'll move on as if nothing happened. Human minds don't work that way, and so people suffer from the end of that. Um, and some of them suffer and they won't say anything, and some of them suffer and become defiant because they don't like the suffering. But, yeah. Anyway, so next week we'll, uh, we'll get into how secure is global warming uh, as a foundation for theology. And then um, we'll see what else pops up at that point. So if you have suggestions, I'm open. <laughs>